Uh, this is the Lenten season, and uh, the Lenten season is this uh, season in the church where we take a different posture, uh, prepare us uh, on our journey, similar to Christ of going into the wilderness. It is a journey for us uh, to enter into the desert, a uh, place of isolation, uh, a place with little to sustain us uh, in life, but a place that takes away uh, all the extra that we tend to focus on or rely on uh, so that we can focus on God more clearly, for, hear from him more clearly. Uh, and so for this season, uh, we'll be doing a series called Through the Desert, where we have, uh, we're going to hear the stories of uh, folks from this faith family who have gone through the desert in different ways and what their journey has been like as God has held and sustained them through these dark valleys. And so, um, and these are just some of the stories of our faith family, uh, but there's some stories that uh, should hopefully uh, resonate with us uh, and challenge us and reveal some of God's truth to us. And so I'm gonna ask Ross if he would come up. He's gonna kick the series off for us today. Uh, he's gonna share some of his story. And then afterwards, uh, we're gonna have a little bit of Q and A uh, where you have a chance to interact and ask questions. Uh, as uh, you may have them, and so feel free to jot those down as you listen to him, um, and then we'll do a little bit of interaction before we continue with our service. So, uh, Ross, I want to thank you for uh, being vulnerable and transparent and sharing. Uh, these stories are uh, delicate. Uh, anytime you've gone through uh, a, a valley, um, that gets real tender, and so uh, these are, I don't, these, these shouldn't be taken flippantly, uh, as it takes a lot of courage to get up here and share these stories. And so, uh, before Ross shares, would you please join me in a word of prayer? God, I pray that you would move through Ross's story and through the words that he shares, that your spirit may guide and direct the message that we hear in our hearts, and that we would be challenged, empowered, and encouraged by his faithfulness as we hear his story. In your name we pray. Amen. Wait, there we go. Got it. Well, I appreciate the chance to, to share today. Um, I, wrote, I wrote my story down, not because I don't know it, but to try to keep me from rambling and to have a point. So I hope you, you bear with me as I, uh, as I share. So I've, I've been asked, as Patrick said, to, to share a little bit about my own personal journey, specifically about some of the struggles that I've had. Um, along the way. So I, you know, I think to effectively tell the story, I, I need to go back and set the stage a little bit for me. Um, I was very blessed to have been raised by a uh, loving Christian home in, in Hamilton County, Indiana. Right? I, I, I like, the jo like the joke that I grew up in the slums of Carmel, uh, which isn't quite true. Uh, but while we had less than most of my peers, uh, I, I certainly had everything I ever needed, much of what I ever wanted and certainly so much very more than others. Uh, I don't think that fact was ever lost on me. My parents were very religious. I wouldn't say they were overly strict or oppressive. They had it really easy with me, though. Might sound a bit arrogant, maybe it is, but I was an incredibly compliant child and teenager. As a toddler, I would literally put myself down for naps and lay in bed and ask permission to get up. Mom's, uh, you know. Like, can you think of a better thing as a, as a toddler? Um, the, the single most rebellious thing I did in high school, uh, I snuck out of the house late at night, and wait for it, uh, to play euchre with friends, you know, and, and drink Mountain Dew. So, uh, you know, I, I did occasionally drive over the speed limit, but uh, yeah, there was a reason my sister liked to refer to me as the golden child. Um, so I guess the point is, I had it pretty easy growing up. I didn't really have much adversity to, to speak of. So I think that, along with growing up in, in, a, in a religious environment, um, shaped me in a certain way. Uh, and, and the biggest impact it had was, was on my perception of my own goodness and righteousness. Because under that veneer of goodness lay dormant some, some pretty deep-seated problems for me. The first was that I was much more concerned about looking good than being good. 
And while that didn't exactly manifest itself in this Eddie Haskell-like secret rebellion, it did close me off to true spiritual growth. So as long as I was acting good, I was good. Uh, my intentions, my emotions, my desires were a distant second to my actions. If I harbored resentment or envy or greed, as long as I stuffed it down far enough and didn't really act on it, I was fine, or, or so I thought. The second problem was probably even bigger and, and somewhat related to the first. And it was really that my identity, my, my understanding of who I was, my own self-worth, and essentially my faith, they were all tied up in this goodness. So I had this spiritual arrogance about me. I was very proud of how good I was. I would often compare myself favorably to others. I would often think and sometimes even say things like, I would never do that when looking at, judging really, other people. I was very concerned about rep my reputation as a Christian. I would say and do things that help me look good within my Christian circles. You can probably see where this story is headed. I went off, of course, to a Christian college. I met and married at the wise old age of 20, uh, the, pretty much the first serious girlfriend I ever had. A Christian girl, of course. Preacher's kid to boot for bonus points. You know, I bought a Christian house, got a Christian job, started having Christian kids, kept having kids. <laughs> um, and on the surface, right, everything was great. Um, probably could have been on the cover of Focus on the Family magazine. I don't, I don't know if they have a magazine, but if they did, probably could have been there. And the problem was everything wasn't great. It was not even close. Um, the marriage was dysfunctional. Uh, the funny thing about having five kids in 10 years is that you stay busy enough, you do enough divide and conquer activities that even the most dysfunctional marriage can just look busy and look a lot like everyone else's life. So you sort of barreled along 100 miles an hour, mostly oblivious to the problems and certainly avoiding dealing with them directly. So when we slammed into divorce going that fast, it was, it was ugly. Now, a lot of people go through divorce and oftentimes it, it, it is ugly. That's not really what this story's about. Um, the story's about what was going on with me. Um, so as the wheels came off the marriage, I, I blamed myself, and certainly I carried my share of the responsibility. By the time we got to the point of being able to sit down and talk about the issues, uh, at least as I saw them, I had inflicted significant harm on the marriage, and so I felt guilty about that. Uh, and I took the lion's share of the blame and the shame that went along with it, you know, that the, the, the good Christian couple that was having problems that everybody was sort of whispering about. And really two things happened simultaneously. Um, that value that was so rooted deeply in being good was shattered. You know, a, a good Christian might have marriage troubles, but a good Christian wouldn't get divorced, certainly not when there's five kids involved. A good Christian, in fact, would do whatever it took to make it right. You know, God never wants us to divorce. So if it isn't working out, then I, as the spiritual head of the family, I had to be the problem. These were the things that were said to me, sometimes yelled at me, you know, by my Christian friends and family. So at the same time that my very identity was ruined, um, the vast majority of my support group, almost exclusively made up from people from my church, not faith, mind you, they either vanished or they turned on me. Some because they were on her side, some because they were just uncomfortable, didn't know what to do or say. You know, some tried to help, and, you know, they would offer these sort of tidbits of advice or share, you know, some little nugget of something that, that worked for them. But if that didn't fix it, they had really nothing else to offer. Um, I had this group of friends that you know, I'd get together with on, uh, for the Watch Monday Night Football. And these, I mean, that, these were friends I'd had for, for 20, almost 25 years. Um, and I mean, one, of them, one person in that group was a little new to the group actually said, well, I, I, can't, I, I can't talk to you. Because if I, you know, even just even just associating with you, I'm I'm enabling your divorce, and I'm against divorce. So I never quite understood, and but but the whole group then. So I wasn't allowed to be part of that group, and it was 
it was painful. It was incredibly painful um, to, to go through that. My parents uh, were high school sweethearts, going on 45 years of marriage. They didn't understand. Um, actually even questioned if I was still saved because, you know, how could I let this happen? Mind you, I wasn't even the one who filed for divorce, but, you know, we have, we have this tendency to pick victims and, and villains, and, and I, was, um, I was certainly the villain. You know, and a lot, a lot of people would come and they would say things like, you know, God can fix this, or God is bigger than this, but at, at the time, the implication really felt like, you can fix this, you're bigger than this. At least that's how I took it. So here I was, 38 years old, and for the first time in my life, having to deal with something difficult. Divorce is hard, but truly, that part was actually the least of my worries, and it wasn't easy, navigating the divorce, adjusting to life as a single dad, learning how to cook and care for the kids when I had them. And I can laugh about this now, but I literally did not even know how to make boxed mac and cheese when I, when I separated. I had to phone a friend for help to figure that out. But all that was actually easy compared to the rest of what I was dealing with. I just carried a lot of guilt and shame. You know, somehow if I'd only prayed harder or better or tried harder, or if I'd just been willing to kind of go back into the misery of the dysfunction that was there, if I'd just done those things, then I wouldn't have gotten divorced. Um, so trying to carry that kind of guilt when your entire life has been sort of built upon this image of, of I'm good, and I make good decisions, and I'm a good Christian, it was, it was overwhelming. Um, best parallel to how I can give how it felt spiritually, sort of how the sanctuary feels at Lent. You know, we, we cover up everything beautiful with these dark sheets. So while you know the beauty is there, you, you can't see it. And after a few weeks, it becomes even hard to remember, you know, what, what was even there. And I think everything felt that way. Like, I didn't doubt that God was there somewhere. Um, certainly didn't feel close. Couldn't quite remember what it felt like to be in that right relationship. Um, and I, I definitely felt that he was angry with me, that he was disappointed for me, that he had withdrawn, that he was far from me. So the healing process for me um, began with, with two, two, two really close friends who actually took the time to come alongside me, to listen to me, to encourage me, challenge me, and, and most importantly, to love me. Uh, just to give you an idea of how wounded I was, uh, there was one, every time we would meet, he would, he would turn to me and he'd... he'd in the eyes and say, Ross, you're a good man. And I would, it's funny that, you know, it's been six years. <laughs> I practiced this like five times and it was fine. But it's funny how that comes back, you know, and say you're a good man. And I would just weep. Sitting there at McDonald's with this guy and I'm like weeping. Um, and uh, it just went straight to that wound. That, that, was, that was there. And uh, he and, and, and a buddy from college were, were two that, that really made a point to do that. And that's really where the healing started for me, was um, those two affirming that in me and letting me, encouraging me to start to move forward. So, um, and you know, just, it went, went straight to that, to that wound right, that I built my whole identity on. So it really took time for me to understand what was going on with me, that uh, I wasn't crazy, I hadn't lost my mind or my faith. So I really became very focused on figuring out what went wrong in my marriage, what changes I had to make myself, because I never wanted to go through it again. I held tight to the few old friends who stuck with me and started to make some new relationships. So during this time, I stopped going to church. Um, the church I'd grown up in, where I'd attended alongside people I'd known for decades, 
at church had become a point of pain for me, so I stopped going. Since nearly all my friends attended there, those relationships stopped too. So after nearly a year of working on myself, I was at a better place. Kim and I were dating. We wanted to find a church home. We wanted to see my kids see that I hadn't given up on God. Which was true, but in this process I found that the faith I'd built since childhood didn't quite hold up through a tough, tough time. I found that many of the things that I thought I knew, they simply weren't true. Those things maybe worked okay when things were great. They didn't work so well when things got hard. So I had to let go of, of many of those false narratives. Uh, I think I had a sense I needed to replace them with better ones. So during this time, the image that, that frequently came to my mind was that I, I built my faith kind of like a tent, and, and it had a whole bunch of stakes in the ground, all these things that I believed. And, and the stakes were in, weren't in the ground real deep, but they were, they were in the ground. And, it was fine, you know, until the wind came and the rain came, and uh, they didn't hold. So now I was trying to repitch that tent, and um, and I knew I was probably going to use a lot fewer stakes to drive into that ground, but I wanted to drive them deeper and really find some of those core truths that I could hold to. So one day, Kim and I walked into faith. Um, I'd say by chance, but I don't think it was by chance. Um, sort of freaked out at the tables um, and really almost walked out. I think it was Sonia who caught us and kind of got us to sit down. And we stayed and we learned that, you know, you guys weren't as weird as what we thought when we walked in the door. Consequently, it was the last time we sat on that side of the sanctuary, I'm pretty sure. So the process for me since that day has really been a slow rebuild of my faith. Um, I'm really grateful for the apprentice group and the work that we've collectively done to walk through the false narratives that we hold about God and how to replace those with kingdom narratives. I by no means have it all figured out, uh, but I and, and we are in such a better place. Uh, I'm thankful for the journey. It's difficult to boil this down to just a few things, but I think there are a few huge lessons that I learned through the process. Um, kind of joke that some of these lessons are hard to learn when you're 38 with five kids. I wish I'd learned them when I was 17. Um, but for me, uh, you know, better late than never, I suppose. Uh, the first is, you know, when someone's in a pit, the only way to help them is to get down in that pit with them. You know, I, I had an awful lot of people stand at the top of the hole <laughs> and look down and yell a word or two of encouragement. A lot it's better than nothing. It doesn't really help actually helps is someone coming alongside you um, loving you right where you're at and encouraging you to move forward to um, thinking you have it all figured out pretty dangerous station in life I look back now I can see how foolish I was I can say I really thought I had God figured out and therefore life figured out it was incredibly judgmental I wasn't all that vocal about it, but it was definitely in my heart. The funny thing is about being judgmental is you tend to hang around judgmental people. Uh, I wonder what, if that's what Christ means when he says, judge not, let you be judged. That's certainly what I experienced. Three, uh, the longer you wait to address something, the harder it becomes. Um, I, I come from a long legacy of avoiders. Um, so my natural tendency to sugarcoat, to justify, to excuse, to overlook, and otherwise avoid dealing with difficult issues. Um, I've learned the hard way that if you do that, the time come, when the time comes and you have to deal with them, it really is unfair to the other person. It's so much better to speak the truth in love earlier rather than later. Four, nothing good comes from a place of fear. I was at my lowest point, I was so very afraid. I was afraid I'd be alone. I was afraid that my kids would blame and abandon me. I was afraid I'd be forever miserable. What I found to be true is that when I was fearful, when I was uncertain, the one thing that would help me to overcome was to lean hard on what I knew to be true. 
those tent stakes I started pounding deep into the ground were so very important. Coming to faith and being inspired by a group of people who collectively don't have all their stuff together and are okay with it, but hold each other up along the way, that sucked me in. It really did restore in me a hope for something better. At last, uh, there always is that hope. Right? I couldn't have dreamed six years ago that I'd be here today. I'm incredibly blessed. My kids have turned out better than I ever could have imagined. Happily married. Hopefully get the marriage thing right this time around. Spiritually well, I'm a long way from having it all figured out, which is a great place to be. But I can see these differences and how I act and respond and live. I think of them as landmarks along the journey where I know that old Ross would, would have been a hot mess. New Ross doing all right. Um, I'm losing my job of 21, day, uh, 21 years, 21 days. I'm losing my job of 21 years, 12 days from now. I can tell you old Ross would have been a mess. There's a lot of reasons for that. I'm doing okay. Been through darker times. Come out the other side. The job doesn't define who I am to figure out how to pay the bills, but I know that that we can do that. So it's been quite a journey. Um, As difficult and and as painful as it's been at times, I wouldn't undo any of it. Um, Because I can see looking back on it, it's what initiated much of what needed to happen in me. So, uh, you know, I share this just with the hope that that someone might find some encouragement in, in any part of it. Really appreciate you letting me share with you today. I think Patrick was going to open up for questions. Good stuff. Thanks. Not easy stuff. Hmm. I got a million things. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Appreciate it. Um, Yeah, I got a few things I want to I want to just give you. I remember actually the first time you came, uh, Jeff and I were standing at the doors uh, and I thought uh, Rob Bell was walking into the church. Like, <laughs> I thought, I think that's Rob Bell coming here. So I was a little disappointed when I found out it wasn't Rob Bell. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been okay. You know, it's, you're all right, I guess. Um, no, we've been walking five years together. You know, you've been unpacking the story and trying to uh, figure out this new place and uh, figure out us and, and rediscover God. Um, so a few things. What, why do we focus, not that I expect you to answer this, but why do you think we focus more on uh, looking like good Christians as opposed to being good Christians? It's easier. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think... Um, I, I think one, it, it, I think it really is easier. Um, and, you know, I, I think for me, right, like the, when, I, when I say I grew up in a religious environment, you know, by, by religious, that's sort of, sort of I guess, what I, what I mean was that, um, you know, we, we tend to um, try to simplify things down to rules, right? You know, and, and, and sort of black and white, and you're good or you're bad, you're right or you're wrong. And um, that's certainly the way I, I grew up and the mentality that I, that I grew up with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of it was, was fear-based. I didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> let, me look, let me look right. Um, so. Yeah, so, um, mo- so part of it is, is about, um, one side of it is the issue of being on the right side, not the wrong side. Uh, and, and you said something to the effect of, um, you know, divorce isn't the problem. It's something that, sits, that was sitting deeper within. Yeah, but, the, but it's easy for the church to look at divorce and say, no, that is the problem. That's the wrong side. Um, but when you get to the other side of, of being a good Christian, you realize that, that being a good Christian isn't necessarily uh, one that is um, morally perfect, but more that is a posture of, um, what would you say those characteristics are? 
Um, yeah, I think humility, um, honesty, um, love, um, forgiveness, um, I'm missing out many, but yeah. You, so you, honesty, and so honesty, I'll, I'll correlate that to truth. Those things which mm -hmm. are true. You talked about truth a little bit in there. Um, why? Why do we? Why do we as Christians? I think we all struggle with this. Uh, why do we struggle with giving support and care when we see people go through? these hard things, be it divorce, being some of the other realities of life, why do we tend to do this as opposed to take on another posture? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, it was hard for me to get upset with a lot of those folks because I think, I, you know, I, I, I would have done the same thing. Um, and, and that's the way I acted for a long, for a long time. And um, I think it had a lot to do with, do with my own um, discomfort. Um, and, and my own need, like, to feel like if I'm not doing something to make it better, then I'm not really, you know, I'm not really helping. Um, so, you know, that's why I, you know, gosh, I mean, I think we've all experienced it. Um, think of just people who try to give these platitudes, right, of, you know, some, some little saying that's supposed to help you feel better of, you know, well, Bumper sticker theology. Bumper sticker theology, it, yeah. yeah, right? Like, well, God, God has a plan. God won't give you too much, more than you can handle. Um, Jesus is my co-pilot, you know, right? What, whatever these things, and, and you don't really, when you're in it, like, they, they're not meaningful. <laughs> they aren't helpful, and they're usually just the opposite. They're usually and there may hurtful. be truth to those things, right. but they, they, they kind of uh, sideline the deeper pain and the reality and the struggle that is actually going on is, yep. is what I found. Because yep. when you look at those things, you say, well, it's, it's not like that's not true. Mm -hmm. It's just not helpful. <laughs> right. <laughs> like when you right. talked about being down in a pit, um, and, and I, I saw myself in this, um, we kind of stand at the top of the pit and we say to the person down in the pit, well, why'd you get yourself into this mess? Mm -hmm. And we, and we kind of, we put this blame on you. Well, you, you got yourself into this, right? Another uh, bumper sticker <laughs> theology is God helps those who help themselves. Yeah, so you, right. you got yourself into this. You need to get yourself out of it kind of a thing. Uh-huh. Right? And Definitely. That, that's exactly what, uh, at least I know I feel, is one who sometimes stands outside of the pit and looks down at that person with uh, an air of, of condemnation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Five, six years later, you say, uh, you know, the power of your friend who said, you know, you're Ross, you're a, you're a good man. What makes that truth so hard to hear? Why do we struggle to hear that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we equate goodness with, with our actions, right? I mean, that's, that's the measuring stick. That's the report card for, for goodness. That's you know, these, these external actions that you can see and touch and, and, and feel. So, you know, for me, it was, felt like I'd failed, felt like I was getting an F on the, on the goodness report card. Um, so it, it was, it was, it was, it was really important for me to hear that, but it was hard to hear it because I didn't believe it. Um, and we fail, we fail up, like we fail by all the standards that we think a good Christian is. Like we just scored an F on all those. And we, so we begin to believe, in fact, that we are not good. Mm -hmm. And so to hear that truth spoken into us, we, we want to believe it, but at the same time, we're not sure we really do or that we even deserve yep. to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, I had a friend, I, I remember this, it, it really resonated with me because he, he said, you know, we really need to stop using that term, he's a good Christian man, or he, she's a good Christian woman. Say she's a good woman or a good man. You say they're a Christian man or a Christian woman. Don't try to qualify. Like, what, what does a good Christian man look like, right? Um, 
and that, that really resonated with me as I was walking through that. I'm like, yeah. Well, it's uh, interesting. Even even someone comes to Jesus and says, "You're you're a good teacher," and he says, "I'm." Don't call me good. I'm like Jesus himself says, I'm not good. Only God is good, right? And, and so we use these uh, mm -hmm. quantifiers uh, to, to kind of identify one another where the reality is, if, is if we talk about a good Christian, maybe a better image of a good Christian is, is not one who has it all together, um, but one who more open and honestly deals with the reality of life, recognizing that the reality of life uh, is messy. I think some of the times the reason we do this is because I'm afraid that if I do this, the mess of your life is going to splash <laughs> onto yeah. my life. And then yeah. my life becomes messy. And, I, and I'm not sure I want to put my salvation in jeopardy. And that may also come with inconveniences. That that level of friendship here may require uh, time and effort and energy and sacrifice that uh, is a whole lot easier if I say, get yourself out of this mess. Do better. <laughs> right. Yeah. It doesn't help. Yeah. Just the time for a couple of questions. If, uh, if anybody's got them out there on the floor, anything that may have uh, come up in your mind or in your head as you heard Ross share his story. Yeah. Um, back to talking about the gentleman that told you that you were a good man. Um, taking it from the perspective of someone who was on the outside, can you speak to why you think um, he had the wisdom, why he knew that's what you needed to hear? Yeah, I, um, he was someone that I, he was a little older than me, um, and it's sort of been a quasi-mentor for me through, through the church. So he knew me, he, he did know me pretty well. Um, and, you know, he, he shared with me in that time of just some of the difficulties he had had in his own marriage and, and had walked through. So, you know, I think that was, um, I think that was part of it. But um, he, he had, I, I, you know, I just, I think it was God-given wisdom, truly, is, is the, the biggest answer. Because he, he did, like, he... Um, every time like I just craved our time together because I I was I was at that point where I just soaked it in and he listened and he asked really good hard questions um, and um, and he firmed that that in me at the same time so um, I think it's probably the combination of those things but, but I, I really think that was God God given wisdom you did say that was at McDonald's, though, and so, I mean, <laughs> eating McDonald's may have put you in tears and distress is, is a possibility, I'm just saying. I would trade one of my children for a cheeseburger right now, so <laughs> probably need to stop talking about McDonald's. <laughs> no we'll offense, guys, no offense, but love you, love you. Uh, we'll take one more question, if there is one. Uh, I was kind of interested about um, some of the false narratives you had about God, um, and you mentioned a few of them about how God uh, was angry or disappointed in you, and um, I just didn't know, I uh, wondered what the main one was for you that you had to uh, work through. <laughs> yeah, whew. Um, it's probably a fairly long list, but you know, I, probably out of the gate, one, one of the biggest ones for me is, is what I had always learned and thought was that the way God worked, right, was that God laid down this perfect path for you to take, right? So as a Christian, like God, God's already laid down your perfect life out in front of you, and it's your job as a Christian to discern it and follow that line, right? So that, that's really what I thought um, all, the, all the way through, and, and that, um, you know, literally, like, toe the line, right? Um, so, so then you're, you know, I was going through a divorce, I'm like, well, whoa, like, what does this mean, right? Like, is that line gone forever? Am I never getting back to God's perfect plan for my life? Because 
that's not happening, all right? So now, you know, does that mean here's God's plan and now here goes Ross, right? You know, shooting off over here. Um, and that, that was a huge struggle for me. That was probably the, the first narrative that I, I had to really let go of. And it took a lot to, to come to be able to believe, like, no, like, God, God, will, God is with you. God will, will follow you. And, and that's, that's, not, that's not how God works. Um, and, you know, uh, divorce is, is never optimal. It's hard on everybody. Um, but, like, it'll be okay, and, and God will be in it, right, going forward. And um, that, that was probably the hardest thing for, for me to believe. I think that had a lot to do with, with why I was struggle. When I was struggling for a long time, I was just stuck because I, I thought, I, you know, like, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave the line, but that, that line doesn't look so good, God. <laughs> like, I can't, right? Like, in my mind, that, that, that doesn't seem right either, so I just didn't know what to do. Redemption in that looking good Christian model that you kind of talked about, redemption is a conversation that kind of gets lost. Like redemption is a part of the story of salvation. Like it's do the right thing or you're done. It's never, and then if you fall, God meets you in the pit and brings you back to a place of, of wholeness. That is lost in that narrative. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's truly, um, remember somebody saying to me, like, don't, don't ever trust somebody. And, Never fully trust a Christian who doesn't have a limp, right? <laughs> there's, there's something about going through that process and, and being wounded, and I think most of us are at, at one point or another in our lives. Um, and that, that redemption process is, is key. Well, thank sure. you for sharing and your transparency and vulnerability. Let's uh, just have a word of prayer as we continue. God, thank you for these stories. It is in the power of these stories and the story of Scripture that uh, teach us, that sustain us, uh, and remind us of how good you are. Uh, so God, may we be taught more about ourselves, uh, but also be taught more about you uh, as we hear the story of our lives and the struggles and the false narratives that we need to replace to get to a true God who is uh, merciful and gracious and who desires to save us in order to restore us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, John and I were talking about uh, even to do uh, the small changes in the format of the service for this season. Uh, it's difficult for us to provide leadership on Sunday mornings because it's not the normal rhythm. And yet somewhere in that place where my uh, soul is prone to wander, I feel there begins to be a shift, a change in my life, a change in my spirit that begins to allow me with humility to seal, see my own frailty my own limitness, my own ability to control the world that I so seek to control around me. And in that comes surrender. It takes me to a place where I can hear and see Christ more clearly in my life, and where I can hear and see Christ more clearly in the lives of others. And not some polished Christ, but a Christ who is rustic, who crawls down into the pits, into the earth, who becomes Emmanuel, God with us. And so Lord, grant to us the simplicity of faith and a generosity of service that gives without counting the cost, a life overflowing with grace poured out from the one who has given us everything that we might show the power of love to a broken world and share the truth from a living word. Lord, grant us the simplicity of faith and a yearning to share it. May God be with you. Go in God's peace.